Undoubtedly, the most valuable test to help with a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis is an MRI scan of the brain. And indeed, almost everyone with MS, with rare exceptions, has typical lesions on MRI scans of the brain, as shown here. This is a study on someone who was reportedly stable with MS over a one-year period. MRI scans were done every two weeks with the images superimposed, and you can see the lesions coming and going. But it's not so easy, because many people in the general population have white matter lesions on MRI that are not related to MS at all. For instance, the MRI on the bottom shows subcortical and periventricular white matter lesions, highly typical of MS. But the MRI on top, and these are three slices from the same scan, shows patchy subcortical, poorly defined white matter lesions not in typical locations associated with MS. These are so-called UBOs, or unidentified bright objects, and they're very common. There's evidence they're due to vascular disease. They're associated with vascular risk factors like diabetes diabetes, hypertension, smoking, and aging, and they're also associated with migraine, and they're very common. This study found that 75% of people with chronic migraine have these UBOs, and so people with not MS are commonly misdiagnosed as having MS because they have an abnormal MRI. And a famous study by Dr. Mara Casey at Cedar sinai and UCLA in Los Angeles found that nearly 18% of people with MS are misdiagnosed and they actually have something else. To learn more about this, click the card above. And these are the alternate diagnoses they found in the study. And some of the more common diagnoses were migraine, 16%, and small vessel disease or vascular disease of the brain, known as leukoariosis, that can cause the lesions which are not MS that I showed you earlier, along with various other diseases that could mimic multiple sclerosis. Now, the remainder of the video will compare and contrast MRI features which are typical of MS versus atypical of MS and more consistent with UBOs or leukoariosis. But keep in mind that you should self-diagnose at your own risk because there are a thousand other neurological diseases not covered here which can cause white matter lesions. Also, there are always in-between cases where a diagnosis cannot be reliably made solely by looking at the MRI. Let's start by looking at features which are typical of MS on MRI scans. We'll start with this axial image going through the brain like this. You can see the skull on the outside and the fluid-filled spaces, the lateral ventricles here, and these lesions which are periventricular. In other words, they touch the ventricles. And there are these radial finger-like projections, often called Dawson's fingers, that extend from the ventricles. They're different from subcortical lesions which may be close to the ventricles, but not touching them. You can see these lesions are ovoid or oval-like in appearance, and they're very well demarcated between normal and abnormal tissue. There's also involvement of the corpus callosum, the connection between the two halves of the brain. You can see this lesion in the right splenium or back of the corpus callosum. Sometimes with acute lesions, there's a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, and the lesions can enhance. What this means is the gap gadolinium dye can get through the blood-brain barrier into the lesions, as seen here. You can see this very bright, avid enhancement, which is typical for new multiple sclerosis lesions. They often enhance for approximately one month after a formation. This would be atypical for a small subcortical stroke, even if it's acute. In MS, if the MRI of the brain is equivocal, it may be helpful to get an MRI of the spine. You're looking at an MRI of the cervical spine with sagittal images like this, and here you can see these typical multiple sclerosis lesions, though beware that not everyone with MS has lesions in the spine. Moving back to the brain, as I mentioned before, it's common for MS to involve the corpus callosum. Here you're looking at sagittal images through the center of the brain. Here you can see the nasal cavities and the cerebellum. And this structure is the corpus callosum that connects the two cerebral hemispheres. And you can see these white lesions like stripes lining up. This is sometimes called a white picket fence sign. I have another example here, lesions in the corpus callosum that are highly typical of MS. You can see similar lesions in another disease called Susak's disease, though you, they usually have a smaller, rounder, snowball-like appearance. You can also get these lesions that are right next to the cortex. Here you can see a T2 axial image, and you can see the cortex, which looks bright, where the cells, the neurons are, and the underlying white matter, which is dark, and this is typical of T2 sequences, the opposite of 
of what you would expect in the opposite of T1 sequences. And you can see this lesion right at the junction between gray and white matter. Modern studies, and sometimes on T7 MRI, you can actually see there is involvement of both the gray and white matter, so-called leukocortical lesions. These lesions are known as juxtacortical lesions right next to the cortex, and they're typical of MS. Sometimes they can be a little bit longer. It turns out they're fibers known as U-fibers that connect two different parts of the cortex, corticocortical fibers, and they can have this U appearance, hence they're called U-fiber lesions, very typical of MS. And here's another imaging showing these juxtacortical and U-fiber lesions, really just the same thing, but U-fiber lesions have this distinctive shape. And here you can see another spine lesion typical of MS. You can also get brainstem lesions. This is an axial slice a little bit lower down in the brain. You can see the eyes, nose, and ears here. And we're looking at the pons, middle cerebellar peduncles, and cerebellum. And you can see this lesion in the right middle cerebellar peduncle and this other lesion in the left cerebellum, very typical of demyelinating disease. This is another example, different MRI. You can see this enhancing lesion in the right posterior middle cerebellar peduncle. This could cause lesions such as tremor, dizziness, or if it involves the sixth cranial nerve nucleus, you could get double vision when looking to the right side. One other clinical pearl is that sometimes within the middle of multiple sclerosis lesions, we can see a little black dot. It turns out this is a vein or a flow void generated due to the movement of blood. It turns out that MS lesions tend to form around the post-capillary venules, the new veins that form after the capillary bed ends. And this is seen in the majority of multiple sclerosis lesions, best seen on T7 and T3 MRI scans, but sometimes seen on 1.5 Tesla MRI scans as well. And this feature, the central venule, is being developed as a potential tool to help prevent the misdiagnosis of MS in distinguishing between demyelinating lesions and lesions due to other neurological diseases. And next, we'll move to MRI findings that are not typical of multiple sclerosis. So what you're going to see now are changes that are associated with so-called UBOs or vascular disease or leukoareosis. So this axial slice shows these small and poorly defined T2 bright lesions in the subcortical white matter. So they're not periventricular, they're not touching the ventricles, they're relatively small, they're a little bit indistinct. I have some other examples here. This is a right frontal subcortical UBO, very benign in appearance. Sometimes they can be a little bit more extensive. So here you can see these patchy indistinct lesions. Again, they're not in the corpus callosum, not in the periventricular area, not appearing to be consistent with the white picket fence sign or Dawson's fingers, not juxtacortical lesions, and it's not an exact science. Sometimes there can be a little bit of an overlap between what could be considered a UBO or a typical multiple sclerosis lesion, but this MRI is very distinctively not typical of multiple sclerosis. Now, what can be a little bit confusing is just because lesions are not typical of MS does not mean they're minor or subtle or insignificant. They can actually be quite impressive on MRI scan. Here you can see quite a few patchy, indistinct lesions lesions, they're quite impressive, but not typical of multiple sclerosis. You can see they're very patchy and poorly demarcated. Here's another example. You can see in the frontal lobes, they're almost becoming confluent here. Here you can see quite impressive vascular disease, and it can involve the periventricular area a little bit. You see this frontal lateral ventricle horn capping, typical of vascular disease, a common benign finding. But you can see there's actually atrophy or loss of brain volume associated with this vascular disease, you can tell because of the enlargement of the lateral ventricles. And here it's very advanced, particularly in an older person with more vascular risk factors. It can be quite impressive on the MRI scans, but these are very patchy lesions, not typical of MS at all. Now, in cases where the lesions are more advanced, it can be quite difficult to discriminate between demyelinating disease and vascular disease. This is a 90-year-old woman with extensive white matter lesions, but you can see it really does involve primarily the subcortical white matter. And if I scroll down 
on the image, you might be able to see it doesn't involve in the periventricular areas, and you can see the juxtacortical areas are somewhat spared. Sometimes looking closely at the brain stem can be helpful. Here we're looking at axial slices at the level of the pons. You can see the internal carotid arteries and the basilar artery here. These are two different images. On the left side, we see these patchy symmetrical lesions, very typical of vascular disease, something we might see in someone with chronic hypertension. And on the right side, we see demyelinating lesions, which tend to be more asymmetrical and well demarcated. You can see this lesion on the left pons and some changes in the left medial cerebellum. So again, symmetrical, more typical vascular disease and patchy, more distinctive and asymmetrical is more typical of demyelinating disease of the brainstem. And this is another example of an MRI of someone with advanced vascular disease. This particular individual had rapidly progressive cognitive impairment due to uncontrolled hypertension known as Binswanger's disease. You can see this extensive subcortical white matter disease, the periventricular capping, this involvement of the external capsule on both sides, and some areas of flare suppression, again, more consistent with infarct than demyelinating disease. And it can be a bit tricky, so we'll compare and contrast some distinctive features one more time. We have multiple sclerosis on the left and vascular disease on the right. If you look at the lesions close to the cortex, you can see they directly touch the cortex, the juxtacortical lesions, where there's a clear area of normal tissue between the cortex and the subcortical white matter in vascular disease. You can see these periventricular lesions which touch the ventricles, the Dawson's fingers, whereas the periventricular area is relatively spared in vascular disease. The MS lesions are a little bit more distinctive and well demarcated, and we can actually see under the microscope a very sharp transition between diseased and normal white matter and multiple sclerosis on autopsies, whereas in vascular disease they're a little bit patchier and more or indistinctive. So I hope those examples were instructive. At the very least, hopefully you appreciate that being a radiologist is easier than it looks. And if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below or if you have suggestions for future videos.